We take our ability to move our body freely for granted. But what happens when you suffer a catastrophic injury that results in a loss of mobility? How would you regain use, or at least find ways to maintain your independence and quality of life? UC Davis professor and physician Dr. John Dorsett and patient Phil McCauley tell their stories and discuss strategies for patient rehabilitation next on Studio Sacramento. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. Bill, what is the worst thing someone faces when they've suffered a catastrophic injury and they're trying to bounce back? I think just um, not knowing what the future holds um, for you when you're um, somebody like me that has been independent for his entire life. Um, it's, it's difficult to kind of have this um, non-independence now. I can't just get up and walk over and grab something if I want to. Um, and, and just you know having to, to rely on other people, whereas before uh, that wasn't necessarily the case. So I think that's the most difficult part. How did you how did you come to your injury? Um, I was in uh, uh, vacation on Maui uh, about a year ago um, with my uh, wife and my parents and my sister, and uh, just running out into the ocean, dove in the ocean, kind of Baywatch style and uh, hit the bottom of my chin on the ocean floor, snapped my neck, and lost all feeling in my arms and legs. And uh, fortunately, my wife and my sister were there, able to pull me out, and here we are today. Dr. Dorsett, when you see a, a patient like Phil, what's your objective when you first sit down and, be, and try to diagnose and treat? Well, generally, when we initially evaluate the patient, we uh, do a, uh, a neurologic examination, so uh, to assess uh, their their level of injury. So, um, the cervical spinal cord injuries um, affect the upper extremities. So, in a patient like Phil, we'll do an examination of the um, the deltoid muscles, the biceps, the triceps, the wrist extensors, all the hand muscles, in order to to determine the the level of injury and um, how complete the injury is. And with that examination, we can then um, uh, have an idea of how independent that patient would be um, at the completion of inpatient rehabilitation. And, and typically, when you're seeing your, the type of patient that typically is sent to you, how long is it that uh, you have before that you really need to get them into rehabilitation and starting on figuring out what their path is? Generally we're waiting for their medical stability um, so uh, once they are able to um, tolerate being in the upright position initially patients uh, have episodes of hypotension where their blood pressure drops and they become very lightheaded um, and uh, they also have uh, could potentially have other medical problems associated with their initial injury. If it's a motor vehicle accident, they may have um, a pelvic injury or abdominal injuries or chest injuries that where they may not be able to to tolerate therapies. So um, it varies depending on the individual patient um, when they are ready for acute inpatient rehabilitation. And you're in a wheelchair yourself. How did you come to be in a wheelchair? When I was 19, I was uh, on the gymnastics team at UC Davis. I mean, not UC Davis, but UC uh, Santa Barbara, and um, was doing a double backflip dismount off the high bar, and uh, either opened up too soon um, or under rotated and landed on my head and dislocated my neck. 
In, in both cases, it, it seems like these types of injuries are things that just are almost like acts of God, uh, unpredictable and, and random. Is that the case? Yes, there, there are sudden onset injuries where uh, one day you're living your life, uh, the next day um, things are quite different with regards to your ability to, to get around and to, to do things for yourself. Phil, uh, what goes, what emotional issues did you have to deal with when you realized that your life had permanently changed? Um, I think at first I was just hopeful that, you know, um, it was temporary that, you know, I'd gain function back in my arms and legs, um, especially when I was still still on Maui, um, then flew back to, uh, to UC Davis um, shortly in uh, January of uh, 2017, and um, then and there I kind of realized, you know, what was going on. Um, I think emotionally, I think I, I've been pretty stable, I've been pretty positive throughout the whole whole process. Um, I've got a, a, a lot of support from my family and my friends and growing up in a small community like Yuba City, uh, they kind of came together and, and have helped support me in any way that, I, that I've needed. So um, in terms of, you know, having PTSD or anything like that, um, that, hasn't, that hasn't been an issue for me. Was there one particular aspect of your life that when you were going through rehabilitation you really wanted to preserve or find a way to continue doing? Yeah, um, I, I'm uh, big time on athletics and um, would go golfing a lot, play basketball, things like that. And um, not, you know, not being able to do that um, has kind of been, been difficult for me. Um, but just finding ways around it, you know, still watching sports and enjoying it and being the athletic director at a high school, being able to watch kids enjoy themselves and, and compete during during athletics has been been great for me. I'm, I'm curious about that. You are the athletic director at River Valley High School Correct. in Yuba City. Correct. From, you know, given your circumstances mm -hmm. today, has it in any way informed or altered the way that you approach being the athletic director? Um, it's just, you know, take life one day at a time and, and you know, anything can happen and, um, you know, fortunately kids have been great, you know, going through the, the school, if, if door needs to be opened or anything like that, you know, or if I drop a paper or something, um, kids have been great about, you know, helping me in any way that I need and, and same with the staff members there. And so um, it's just been, it's been good. People call me an inspiration. I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, I'm just doing my job and I'm just happy to be back at work doing what I love to do. So, How, how much does the mental aspect um, of a, a patient, uh, Phil's obviously got a very positive attitude, impact their progress and where it is that a patient ends up when, when they uh, are going through the treatment process? It, it dramatically affects um, their ability to continue to um, be a productive member of society. Um, there's some patients that don't have the family support um, that, that Phil had or that I had um, that uh, don't have the direction, don't have the goals that um, end up having a lot of complications um, from their injury. And, uh, and we see those patients too at, 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 in our clinic and, and through the emergency room, they'll end up coming back in with, with, uh, with complications. Um, so having that family support and having that mindset and those goals um, and the drive really makes a big difference on, on their success and their, their happiness. And I think, I think a lot too of it is um, some of the patients that are there, are the, the work that they do is, is labor work and whatnot. And so for them, they don't really see any light kind of at the end of the tunnel. They don't know what they're going to do, you know, with the rest of their lives, especially somebody my age that, you know, might have been in the construction business or something. You know, what am I going to do now? You know, might be a, a big question that they might have. So. Are, are there any, you know, typically when, when a person becomes disabled, to whatever extent that they are, 
and they go through re rehabilitation after one of these catastrophic injuries. Um, is it the, the point that Phil raises about what they're going to do next is a really big deal. Is there federal support or, or governmental support for helping people that UC Davis connects them up to or anything like that? We have um, a, a social worker that helps plug them into services that may be available, mm -hmm. um, for, such as re-education or uh, uh, social security disability to uh, also help with not only having the patient be able to function well at home, but also to uh, re-educate that patient in order to be able to uh, uh, get some type of uh, employment or some type of work um, to have that gratification. For, for the patients that you see, you know, there's always, a, you know, loved ones around them typically, at least you would hope there would be. What advice would you give to families and friends who have someone within their lives who suffers an injury like this on supporting them in a way that's helpful toward getting them to where whatever the ultimate objective is in terms of functionality. Now that that that's a that's a good question because um, one of the things that we see sometimes with with caregivers is caregiver burnout. So not only do we um, uh, are we concerned about the uh, the patient's ability to uh, deal and cope with the, the, the injury and their impairments, but also the caregivers and making sure that they're um, healthy from a, a, a mental standpoint also. Um, so the advice that we kind of give the patient and the, and the family is to, to help support each other. Um, we have a family meeting, usually at least once during the hospitalization, sometimes twice, to discuss uh, goals that, that the therapists have, goals that the patients have, um, and goals that the families might have um, so that they can feel free to uh, ask questions uh, that they have um, with regards to any particular aspect of the patient's care and their recovery. When your family mm -hmm. was along with you mm -hmm. going through this process, mm -hmm. what were you concerned about in terms of not just, not so much yourself, mm -hmm. but the impact of your new condition on them? Um, obviously, you know, like I said before, super independent. I would go places on weekends sometimes, and my wife would go places on weekends sometimes, not necessarily together. And so just, not you know having her just stay at home versus going out and doing what she enjoys and likes to do uh, fortunately for her she, um, in her work situation she was able to get a lot of time off um, at the beginning the first month uh, she was there pretty much every day all day and would go home to to take a take a snooze and, and come back the next day. And then um, after about a month, she started going back to work in the mornings and would come in the afternoons, come to therapy with me, um, you know, learn techniques as well, um, as well as myself. And, um, you know, just, just being around and, and being supportive. I think she learned just as much as I did during the whole process, which was, was kind of neat. And, um, you know, able to take away those things and apply them to, you know, a year later, here we are. and. We're, we're able to do things that we didn't necessarily think was possible a year ago. So. Like what? Um, just just moving around, her able to go um, places she wants to go to, um, friends coming up and picking me up and, and going out places, and she can stay at home and relax, you know, for, for an evening and, and whatnot. So um, just all those things kind of coming together that, you would just think, oh, I'm just going to be at home all the time and, you know, be a, a burden on her as, as well. And that hasn't really been, seemed to be the case. So. When, you're, when you're helping a, a patient with their, their treatment, a lot of times, uh, so I'm told, is that they have to learn new ways of doing old things. What tend to be the most challenging areas for patients getting accustomed to in terms of going about the daily routine of life? 
starts from right when you wake up. You know, getting up, getting in and out of bed, getting dressed, um, uh, showering, bathing, all what we call activities of daily living. All of that is challenging, um, you know, depending on, on the impairment. Um, uh, obviously, cervical spinal cord injuries affect the, so that, in other words, the neck and neck injuries um, uh, affect the arms as well as the legs. Um, if you have a spinal cord injury in your thoracic spine, it just affects your legs. So other things such as, you know, uh, dressing your upper extremities or shaving or grooming, uh, if you have your full use of your hands, is, is uh, much easier and is usually not impaired. So um, patients that have strokes, uh, they all have one side of their body, so their right arm and their right leg will not, not be working properly. So it depends on the, um, on the injury, uh, on the impairment, on the diagnosis, uh, uh, but it's, I wouldn't say one thing would be more difficult than, than another, um, but just daily activities uh, uh, are, are difficult and, and there's techniques that the therapists use um, to help uh, the, the patients become as independent as possible. One of the things that we like to, or that we, we are, we are, we're a team. The, the rehab uh, unit is a team. So there's physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists if they have cognitive and swallowing difficulties, um, social workers, the uh, discharge planners, um, uh, the nursing staff. Um, we all work as a team and uh, w to address all the different areas that the patient has, has difficulty with in order to be able to have them as successful as possible and as independent as possible. Well, for instance, um, depending on the severity of the injury, your arms uh, might be impaired as well. Um, has there been anything in, in terms of new technology that's been, that's emerged over the past few years that's been helpful in allowing a greater level of function even though one doesn't have the use of their arms? There's, well there's a, a lot of uh, adaptive type uh, equipment that's used to, mm -hmm. to help. If you can't um, use your uh, your hands very well. There's different types of cuffs that can be used to utilize like a pencil or for um, for uh, utensils for eating. Um, th those have been around for a long time. Um, I think the the biggest uh, area where there's been uh, a lot of significant improvement is really technology um, and the uh, utilizing technology to be able to uh, communicate with others, uh, the, the iPad being able to, envir uh, to use environmental controls um, with uh, electronic type equipment. There's some surgical procedures that are done to try and um, uh, improve function such as tendon transfers. Um, those, so in other words, taking a, a particular muscle that's, that's strong and moving that tendon to to a different uh, area in order to improve functioning. When you do that though, you lose a little bit of strength in that muscle also. So those are used sometimes, but, uh, but relatively infrequently. Well, Phil, I I'm curious mm -hmm. as to, you are a very active guy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> how, much, uh, how much function do you still have, for instance, in your arm? Um, I've, I've gained a lot more just arm function in general. I mean, when Dr. Dorsett saw me, you know, first I was just arms like this, you know, no movement at all. Um, there, there's a little tricep flicker in, in my arms now, um, but definitely not full strength. Um, but I think just time, uh, you know, you, you kind of figure out what happens over time and, and time has, has helped improve that and just going to therapy and, and strength training um, has helped with that. So. Um, do you but, have it? Do you have any goals for where you'd like to ultimately be? I mean, ultimately, if I had full use of my hands and my triceps back, that would be great. If if I if I I would take that over over walking any day, honestly. Um, you know, and if I happen to walk someday, that'd be great too. But I think just just having that 
Mac, but like Dr. Dorsett said, um, technology has been great to me. Usually I have my iPad on my lap. It's my communication device, Apple Watch now. I mean, I'm able to talk to people throughout my house. I've gotten an Amazon Echo almost in every room now and uh, turn on the lights and turn off the lights via that. And um, just all those different things now that we have in terms of technology have been, been amazing for me. You said something really interesting. You said you'd rather have your arms back than your legs, mm -hmm. and, and I, I would have assumed the opposite. Mm -hmm. Why are the arms? Why were the arms be preferential to the legs? Like Dr. Dorsett said, um, just being able to to you know shave myself without you know cutting my face all the time. Um, I, I in my in my line of work typing and. Having 60, you know, words per minute beforehand um, was good. I mean, with Dragon Dictation now, that's kind of taken that away, but it's almost like learning a new language when you're using that software system. And so um, just those type of things, you know, being able to shoot a basketball and, and whatnot would be uh, uh, just, to me, that'd be so, so great to be able to use my arms fully again. And, and is his point of view uh, pretty common? in terms of that the arms are more important than the legs? Uh, I don't know. Um, I've, I've never um, heard that question being uh, asked before. Well, so then it's a first. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's a first. So I, I don't know if I can, I can comment on that. Um, yeah, I just haven't heard that question before. Okay. So it, it's, uh, well, when, uh, you know, this treatment team that comes around the patient, uh -huh. that uh, that sort of guides them on the path to wherever it is that they end up. When, when do you assess or how do you assess when someone has reached the limits of re what rehabilitation can bring? Generally, from a neurologic standpoint, um, about 80% of the neurologic recovery that they're going to get back, they'll get back like within the first uh, six to nine to 12 months. Why is that? It's, it's how the nervous system um, heals itself. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but the acute rehab aspect of things is geared towards aggressive inpatient rehabilitation um, initially in order to maximize their function so that they can be, get home safely. That's just the first phase of rehabilitation. The second phase really is outpatient, uh, either outpatient or home health uh, therapies and rehabilitation. So there's a lot of education that goes on for the, the patient and their families to do um, at home in addition to outpatient uh, uh, therapies in order to continue their their progress. I'm curious uh, when you talk about inpatient rehabilitation, the 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 push of you know the health insurance world and a lot of uh, folks in medicine has been move people out of the inpatient setting, get them out as as quickly as you can. It it sounds like your particular specialty moves a little bit slower on that notion. Not necessarily. The lengths of stay for, for rehab patients has significantly diminished over the last decade. Um, and our average length of stay on our unit right now is around 15 days. Of, but that's for all patients. So it's for trauma patients, it's for stroke patients. Spinal cord injured patients generally tend to stay longer but uh, when I went through rehab, it wasn't unusual for a cervical spinal cord injured patient to stay uh, for two or three months. We've talked a lot about the, the spinal cord injury type patient thus far. Tell us a little bit about the other categories of patients that come in. You mentioned stroke, for instance. Yes, we, um, the, the general categories of patients that we see on, on our unit uh, we're a level one trauma center at UC Davis, so we see a lot of trauma patients. Um, so those would be patients, you know, spinal cord injury patients are, are often trauma patients, uh, head injury patients, um, patients that have multiple orthopedic injuries, 
uh, pelvic fractures, uh, upper and lower extremity fractures, um, as well as uh, patients, uh, stroke patients, um, and uh, multiple medical complex type patients, uh, such as Guillain-Barre or, or patients that have had um, uh, cardiac surgery with a left ventricular assisted device, LVAD type patients. Um, we see uh, a real wide variety of patients on our acute inpatient mm -hmm. rehab unit. And, and Phil, just very quickly, mm -hmm. One, uh, one sentence, what is the one thing you, it, it, as you go through this therapy that you can't do today, but ultimately you'd like to be able to do again? Be able to use my arms again at, at full function. All right, and we'll leave it there. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax, see you next time right here on KVIE. At Five Star Bank, we create thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive, from economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. This Studio Sacramento episode is supported by UC Davis Health, where doctors, nurses, researchers, and staff share a passion for advancing health. Learn more about their latest medical innovations at health.ucdavis.edu. All episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at